So I think more or less some aspects of uh, I previous uh, of a previous distinguished uh, lecturer um, will be addressed, and we will obviously talk about static versus dynamic examination and how motion analysis is so important for our patients. Basically, the case for instrumentation. Biomechanics is, a, is an important part of our profession and we always incorporate biomechanical theories, biomechanical aspects in our treatment, hopefully for the better to, to get our to improve our patient's health or to remove any musculoskeletal complaint and to treat and manage uh, resultant uh, conditions. However, do we ever question what we have been taught? Um, when we are working in our clinic, do we ever question what we are doing? What we, uh, what we practice and how we treat our patients? I've been working as a podiatrist, I won't tell you my age now, uh, for the past 30 years. And over these 30 years, some of the aspects, some of the things I used to do 30 years ago, I started querying now. Why? I, because sometimes theories are so ingrained into us when we are students that we really take everything for granted. And sometimes it feels very strange saying that, look, I've been applying this type of padding, but does it really work? Does it really do what we want it to do? Because sometime when I was like your age, you know, I was 20 years old, someone told me, you know, if you want to reduce pressure under the second metatarsophalangeal joint, you use a pad called a plantar metatarsal pad or a, what we call a plantar cover. And we, okay, we take it for granted. <coughs> Wait, I think, did I miss one? Yeah, case scenario. Okay, case scenario. An example, a patient last month, 19-year-old athlete complaining of bilateral knee pains and as part of his biomechanical examination, we found that he has reduced ankle dorsiflexion. Okay, we are all podiatrists here, and we all know that nor dorsiflexion, ankle dorsiflexion is a requirement for normal non-pathological gait. Right. We presume that the athlete does not dorsiflex sufficiently during gait following our examination. I don't know if this works. Let's see if this works. Yeah, all right. So this is our patient on, on polygon when we did the, the uh, motion capture. Okay. So according to accepted theories, normal gait requires 10 degrees of ankle dorsiflexion. In podiatric biomechanics, according to Root's theory and other, and other biomechanical theories, less than the 10 degrees of dorsiflexion is termed equinus, or limited ankle dorsiflexion. This is very basic, I'm sure, very basic first-year podiatry, agreed? So, as we walk, this is a sagittal plane uh, graph of, ankle dorsif of, of the ankle uh, dorsiflexion plus, uh, versus plantar flexion angle. Okay, so initially we, the foot is at about neutral position or slightly dorsiflexed, then it goes through rapid plantar flexion. Okay, then as we move forward, there is dorsiflexion in close kinetic chain because our foot is on the ground. So it's not actually the foot that is dorsiflexing, but it is the tibia that is moving forward until we get maximum dorsiflexion. Then we get rapid plantar flexion as we push our body forward, agreed? When we push our body forward, and then during, um, during swing phase, our foot starts to dorsiflex again in order to be able to clear the ground. And that is more or less the, the amount of dorsiflexion uh, we get. And as you see here, for example, in this example, the mean dorsiflexion is about 15 or degrees or more, which, 
which according to the root theory is okay, is normal, okay? Now, why is, okay, why is uh, ankle Aquinas so important? Why is it such an important podiatric uh, entity uh, that we have to, that we have to diagnose, that we may be able to diagnose? Because it has been linked to a variety of problems, such as increased pronation. We know that since dorsiflexion is so important in order to walk, if we, ha we do not have sufficient dorsiflexion, our foot will pronate, thus unlocking what is known as the mid-tarsal joint locking mechanism. We know that a, a, a foot in a pronated state is much more flexible. Agreed? Remember that? It's much more flexible than a foot which is supinated. So in, a, in ankle equinus, in order to get that required amount of of the ankle dorsiflexion, the foot is, will pronate, thus unlocking the metarsal joint and getting dorsiflexion from the metarsal joint as well. So it is not really um, a, a very good thing to have because obviously we are increasing stresses in the metarsal joint and ideally the dorsiflexion should come primarily from the ankle joint. And so, so there are what we define as two types of dorsiflexion. One is, is uh, ankle dorsiflexion, as we'll see later on, and one is, is foot dorsiflexion, which is a combination of dorsiflexion movement from the ankle joint and from the metarsal joint, among other joints, okay? So it has been linked to increased pronation. It has been linked to low back pain, hyperextended knees, hallux rigidus, calcaneal spurs, forefoot nerve entrapment, Achilles tendinopathy, posterior, you know, the amount of, of, of pathologies that we see that have been attributed to ankle aquinos in literature, and I'm not saying this, but the literature is saying this, are enormous. So it's very important that we really diagnose our patients well. Okay? So what about this, this patient of ours, the 19-year-old whom we statically diagnosed as having ankle aquinos? Well, that is his, his uh, motion, motion um, uh, the result of his motion capture test. And you see that he's up to 20 degrees there. So this starts us to, to think, why do we really just depend on a static examination? While, as the previous um, Mr. Lavin has already stated, that, you know, dynamic function is so important. People walk. Feet are made for walking, okay? So this is important um, to assess, in my opinion, fee, um, this patient's feet during gait. So uh, as an example of, of some research we have uh, done recently, we examined the relationship between a clinical static diagnosis of ankle equinus and dynamic function of the, of the ankle joint. Basically, um, clinical assessment is usually done using a goniometer, okay? And it is presumed, presently it is presumed that once we diagnose someone with equinus statically, during gait, um, there is a, redu a reduction in, in ankle dorsiflexion as well. We can indeed confirm this very easily by, by, by gait analysis, but how many of us do it? I mean, I for the past 10 years, I, I've never done it. I mean, I, I only do it for research most of the time. Therefore, does this, ankle, this clinical assessment of ankle <laughs> dorsiflexion actually correlate with dynamic function? That is, if a patient is diagnosed statically as having limited ankle dorsiflexion, is there less than 10 degrees of dorsiflexion during gait? Does it affect gait or not? And surprisingly, this the validity of this static examination has never been in, in, uh, examined before. So the aim of this study was to determine whether a clinical diagnosis of ankle equinus or limited ankle dorsiflexion correlates with a decreased dorsiflexion range of motion of the foot and ankle during gait. So the first 20 patients atten attending a primary care foot clinic who were diagnosed with, with limited ankle dorsiflexion were uh, recruited some exclusion criteria including included musculoskeletal conditions of the feet, neurological conditions such as neuropathy, 
systematic systemic disease and history of foot surgery. So basically, what did we do? We we divided the the, the participants into two, two groups. Okay, so one group had more than minus five degrees of dorsiflexion, meaning that. Uh, the one group had more than five degrees of plantar flexion, actually, when we do the examination, okay? At subtalar joint neutral, it's, it's very important. While the other group had between minus five and zero degrees of dorsiflexion. So zero degrees of dorsiflexion, meaning that the foot is at, is at 90 degrees when you apply maximal strength to dorsiflex the foot um, at subtalar joint neutral position. So data collections, um, all subjects underwent motion capture using a Vicon 10 camera system. Uh, they walked along a 70 meter walkway at self-selected speed and we captured data at 100 hertz. And we retained five trials, obviously, we, when we have our, our, um, our subjects all, all marked up, you know, you try to get as many captures as possible. So. Um, we used uh, we we we, made, we kept the best five five trials. We used what is known as the Istituto Ortopedico Rizzoli foot model, or also known as the Leardini foot model. It's a, a very widely used um, in, because the Leardini foot model allows us to to measure intersegmental motion of the foot. It, uh, it divides the foot into a hind foot, mid foot, fore foot, hallux and shank region. So we can measure the intricate also, the intricate motions of the different segments of the foot. It's not like when you use, for example, plug-in gate, which, which you know, models the foot as one rigid lever, uh, one rigid segment. We know that the foot is made up of many segments, agreed, because it is composed of 26 bones and there is a lot of movement inside the foot. And with a Leardini foot model, we can actually measure those small movements of the of the of the various segments of the foot. So following data capture, we did an independent sample T test to compare the mean dynamic ankle and foot dorsiflexion. Now I differentiate between ankle and foot dorsiflexion. As I said, so ankle dorsiflexion is purely the dorsiflexion measured at the ankle, the relationship between the shank and the ankle, okay, while foot dorsiflexion assumes that the foot is a, almost a rigid lever, so it takes into consideration, uh, sorry, not a rigid, a rigid segment, so it takes into consideration ankle dorsiflexion and also mid-tarsal joint dorsiflexion. So it measures dorsiflexion of the foot as a whole in relation to the shank, in fact, to the vertical, okay? So... The mean dynamic ankle dorsiflexion was significantly higher in group B. And as you can see, it's already 14 degrees, which is more than the quoted 10 degrees as, as, uh, as uh, pointed out by the root et al. theory. Okay? While those in group B had only 4.4 degrees. Now, to remind you, group, uh, sorry, group A were those subjects who had more than minus five degrees of dorsiflexion, okay? Likewise, the mean dynamic foot, now it is the combined dorsiflexion, was significantly higher in group B than in group A. In group B, it's actually 17 degrees, much so much higher than the 10 degrees requirement. <coughs> so, in group A, all of the participants had a mean ankle dynamic dorsiflexion, which is less than 10 degrees, okay? And was in group B, 60% of the participants had a mean dynamic ankle dorsiflexion between 10 and 20 degrees, okay? So there's a big, very big variation there. That is only 40% of this group had reduced ankle dorsiflexion. Now, imagine applying this to a clinical setting, which means that if you had 10 patients diagnosed with ankle equinus, only four of them would actually have been, have had ankle equinus, statically speaking. So what is the importance of doing this static, this examination or this diagnosis statically when 
60% of them actually have a higher amount of dorsiflexion. Okay? With foot dorsiflexion, in group A, 60% had a mean dynamic foot dorsiflexion of less than 10 degrees, and in group B, 60% of participants had a mean foot dorsiflexion between 10 and 20 degrees. And as you can see, obviously always, the foot dorsiflexion is greater than ankle dorsiflexion because, because of the movement coming in from the mid-tarsal joint. And we know that, for example, in certain patients, that movement at the mid-tarsal joint, for example, if you look at this subject, now how much difference there is between foot and ankle. Imagine a diabetic patient with charcoal, for example. You know, that applies to all those patients who have hypermobility at the mid-tarsal joint, especially around the oblique axis of the mid-tarsal joint. All the forces, you know, um, being 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 exerted on the mid-tarsal joint, how how damaging that would be to the collapse of the joint and maybe to the development of what we call the rocker bottom foot. That's something to think about. This is this might be much clearer, but it follows the same pattern. Okay, so one of the issues is: Are we talk? Uh, should we talk about ankle dorsiflexion? Should we talk about foot dorsiflexion? Should we take mid-tarsal joint motion in, into consideration? So from this, we concluded that a static lack of foot dorsiflexion at zero degrees minima does not necessarily correlate with reduced dynamic ankle dorsiflexion during gait. Consequently, this test on its own at the criteria of zero degrees and above is certainly insufficient to diagnose ankle, uh, ankle equinus. In fact, 60% of patients in this study actually dorsiflex more than 10 degrees, more than 10 degrees during gait. So pending further research, because there is a lot of work, I, I mean, look, the research into ankle dorsiflexion for about the last 10 years. So the authors propose that should one wish to continue using goniometric measurements, only those patients exhibiting a minimum of 5 degrees of plantar flexion should be diagnosed as having ankle aquinos. And we think that because there are various other issues, but we don't, I, I don't want to go because I can go till this evening. If, uh, <laughs> those patients whose static ankle dorsiflexion is between zero degrees and five degrees should undergo a dynamic investigation, such as gait analysis, in order to reach a proper diagnosis of ankle equinus. Okay? So, I mean, those of you who'd like to read the papers was published, I think, last, week, last month in the foot, if you'd like to, to, to look at this. So... I'll just give you two brief examples because I want, don't want to take the whole morning. Uh, one of the, one of the uh, projects we did with one of our students was to, um, to research the applicability of plantar padding in reducing peak plantar pressures in the forefoot of healthy adults. Okay, so basically um, the results from this study we, we took patients and we did two types of, of, of paddings that we normally use. One is called a plantar cover. I'm not sure if you, you follow me. What's a plantar cover is a felt pad that covers the, the forefoot, okay? While the other is a plantar metatarsal pad, which is normally a pad placed proximal to the central three metatarsals. And we looked at how these reduce pressure, okay? So our results imply limited applicability of the single wing plantar cover and the plantar metatarsal pad. Now, like I said before, I've been using this for about 30 years in, in our patients. They come in pain while put a piece of felt and say, oh, yes, they should be better. There is reduced pressure and all that. But, you know, there is very, very limited applicability. And perhaps, um, okay, perhaps one of the, reasons is that a plantar metatarsal pad we get we get peak forces right during toe off during propulsive phase of gait in which the foot is dorsiflex so if i stick a plantar metatarsal pad underneath the central three metatarsals you know proximal to the phalanx the 
are not actually touching the ground when we walk. Okay? They will only be beneficial if our patients are standing up. Or if we have elderly patients who, who have a shuffling type of gait, who move this way, okay, who do not have a propulsive face. Okay? Um, just going back, and likewise, this, any one of you would like to... Well, this was uh, published maybe four or five months ago in JAPMA, Journal of the American Podiatric Medical Association. Last quick, quick uh, example I'm going to give. How many of you get patients who wear high heels? Hmm. So many patients who wear high heels, you know, and they refuse to remove their high heels. So basically what we do, we stick a pad there, okay? You stick a pad so it will... We... Using, using an inshoe pressure, a tech scan inshoe pressure measurement system, we had, uh, I think, about 15 or 20, 20 uh, ladies who were habitual wearers of high heels. We had the same shoe in different sizes, and we used actually two types of, material, of, of pads underneath the, f the ball of the foot. But one is foam of health. I'm sure you, you are familiar with foam of health. Um, it's something you would use to reduce pressure, don't you? Basically, our results show that if you use felt or foam of felt, the pressure actually increases in high heels. It does not decrease. So I'm doing something to help my patient walk better because she refuses to remove the high heels and, you know, she's in pain. I put in a pad which I hope that will remove the pressure, but it is actually increasing the pressure. Okay, and actually we are working with a new material, uh, with an exciting new material called an auxetic foam. Now this material uh, is a special type of foam that when you, we know that if, if we have a foam and, and we pull a foam, what's happen, what happens to it? It gets narrower, no? There is a special type of material called a, an auxetic material in whose Poisson's ratio, it's called the Poisson ratio, which is the ratio of the increase to the ratio of the decrease in, in the two axes, actually uh, reverses. So when I, when I pull this material, it does not get uh, thinner, but it actually gets thicker. So we are using this material because we are hoping that this material, when we press on it, it does not get thinner, but it actually gets thicker. And it has very promising results. We've, in, this, in this population, um, in this population, um, we had a reduction in, in pressure using this material. While we felt we had a, 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 an increase in, in foot pressure. So, basically, just like to close with this, how often do we use, do we suggest to our patients to use felt padding in their shoes in order to reduce for foot pressure, or we use that a lot. But how do we know if this treatment actually works? Unless we use systems that help us to actually measure, objectively measure, in this case, vertical pressure, right? In shoe, for example, an in shoe system, unless we use this, and unless we incorporate this um, in our um, in our daily routine, okay? Um, I think unless we do that, we, we could be actually doing more harm to our patients than, reduce, than, than, than helping them. So we need to be very careful, okay? Think about it, just think about it, okay? Thank you very much.